focus uh, on this or here today and for these days is really um, focused in the southern region um, because that is where the CDC cooperative agreement related to capacity building for HIV prevention. Um, that's where that, you know, where our, where our NASDAQ organizational focus is. Um, but I did want to note that there are many folks who have registered for this who are from far afield from the south, um, as, as exotic places as Hawaii and Idaho, and <laughs> um, really welcoming sort of a you know, shared space to, um, yeah, really just share strategy and approach uh, for, for building support for harm reduction programs um, and really talking about best practices. Um, so excited to have everyone here today. So um, back to the housekeeping. Um, just so everyone knows, um, all attendees are gonna be outside of the speakers are going to be in, uh, enter into mute as, as muted. Um, you will be unable to mute yourself um, at this point in time. Please feel free to use the chat, use it liberally, use the little, you know, uh, motion things that, you know, interaction um, on the Zoom platform is always welcome and excited. And uh, we are going to have uh, three sessions per day. Um, and uh, just as a note, all of them are gonna be recorded partially you know, we made this decision because we really just want to find ways to extend the reach of your knowledge um, and, and what you bring to the table and your unique experiences here. So, um, and, and really they'll be available for, for folks um, who are unable to attend and maybe registered or have interests. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, and let's see. Uh, yeah, also just, um, you know, real, I, I appreciate, uh, you know, in advance sort of um, patience with technology. Um, NASDAQ, you know, we are, like everyone else in the world, we've gotten better at this over the last year, but it still can feel like a little bit much at times. So um, the way that we have kind of planned this out is, as, as is common in my life, uh, as low tech as possible. So we are really trying to do this whole event through a series of, of, of Zoom meetings um, and Zoom links that can hold up to 300 people. And so um, this will be kind of, if you can imagine, sort of like the main room, this link is consistent um, throughout for each day. And then what we're gonna do is have three sessions. Um, the first is, we're gonna jump in here soon. Um, and then what we'll do is there, are then two Zoom links that you should have gotten in your registration um, emails that both yesterday and today. And so you just choose which session you wanna do and then it'll you know, self-select you over there, okay? Um, and then we'll come back to this like main room and have it one more unified session at the end of the day. And that's pretty much the rundown, the same thing for each day. Um, wanted to try to keep ethos of what these events in the past have been um, and also just uh, offer good, uh, you know, more, uh, opportunities for shared learning and strategizing and networking. So excited to be doing this and bringing this to you all here. Whew. Okay, I think that's pretty, well, pr pretty much it in terms of housekeeping. Um, as you can see here, our first uh, panel is one that we often kind of have as a first panel. And I'll just say for those of you who haven't been to one of these before, this is the fifth uh, harm reduction or syringe services institute um, and that we've had across the country. This is the fourth, I think, in the South. Um, many of our speakers are, uh, and attendees are return customers. And so I always think that that's like a real testament to just how, how important these events really are and just how you know, special a space they can feel like. Um, for everyone, uh, you know, who was in the waiting room, some of the speakers and I were, we were, we were all just talking just before the, actually the last time that we had a Southern SSP Institute was last year on March 10th and 11th, and it was the last travel that we had. And we were, you know, reminiscing a little bit about um, all, you know, how sad it is to not share, be able to share space in person with each other. But um, I will also say there's some really unique advantages to this too. We're, you know, the potential reach for, for this, these sessions for this event um, is far, is really, really big. We could never bring three, 400 people together in, in you know, a conference space like that. And uh, so, yes, we're really excited to be able to extend the reach for this event here. So all of that is to say, I am just so incredibly excited to be here. Um, I know I've said it to many people before, but the first time that we did uh, not NASDAQ, but a Southern regional harm reduction thing ever was about 12 years ago. And I think that there were 30 of us, <laughs> 40 of us, maybe, <laughs> um, in North Carolina. And 
just the idea that there's even four or 500 people who are interested in an event like this in the South uh, just speaks volumes to how far, uh, you know, building support for programs and opening programs and expansion of programs has come in the South. And so really, really excited to be here and uh, share space with everyone. Okay, I've talked enough. Um, so as you can see, uh, our first, you know, our first panel is really kind of focused on just that. How do we, you know, how, how do we um, find unique partners, diverse partners, message about harm reduction in the South? And it is a uniquely, uh, you know, the South and as every region has different, you know, unique strengths and challenges and uh, unique opportunities to find some of those, those key community messengers, key community stakeholder individuals and groups. Um, and there, there are just, there are so many, ways that in the South, and I know this in particular because I've done most of the harm reduction work I've ever done in the South, um, you know, there are just unique strategies and approaches um, when it comes to identifying uh, community leaders, um, when it comes to uh, finding those unique and resilient ways that Southern communities probably already do harm reduction and might not call it harm reduction, um, and, and really uh, finding, you know, those unique allies and, and, and stakeholder groups um, that, uh, are able to, you know, really strengthen the, the base and support for programs. So, um, excited today to be joined by Robin Bellini um, from West Virginia University, um, who's going to talk a little bit uh, about the role of, of academia and, and how to partner with, the, with those folks. And also, you know, West Virginia um, has a very unique coalition and community mobilization um, effort, uh, both well, that's really been activated very recently, um, but historically has been um, a work in progress and built up. And so I'm hoping she can talk a little bit about some of her experiences there really working in the state. Um, and then we're also joined by Donald Davis, who we'll jump to after that, um, who is uh, from the Kentucky Harm Reduction Coalition and operates primarily out of Louisville um, and has uh, always found really unique partnerships um, and base of support in, in, in Kentucky, um, and especially in this last year, right? Um, and after that, we're going to uh, hear more about um, building support um, or the role of faith community um, in building support for harm reduction within communities um, with hearing from Michelle Mathis uh, from Olive Branch Ministries in North Carolina. Um, always lovely to have her here. And then lastly, we're going to round out with um, a dear friend and colleague of mine, Christina, who, uh, Santana, who is actually from NASDAQ um, and does, uh, is the coordinator for um, our Ending the HIV Epidemics Community Mobilization efforts. So really excited to kind of talk a little bit more at a thousand foot level there too about um, some of her experiences working with health departments primarily trying to do community engagement and community mobilization better. Um, so excited to have everyone here and Robin, you good? I'm just going to kick it off to you, okay? Yeah, thanks Laura. Um, so when I got the invitation, I appreciate being here, when I got the invitation to speak um, last week, I thought about it before I said yes. Um, partially because I'm an academic and so I do not generally have to be the person who goes out in the community and tries to gain support for programs, um, although that's happening a lot lately. Um, I said yes for two reasons. One is that um, because I don't work for a specific program, I work with a lot of programs in West Virginia. So I do technical assistance, helping new programs to set up. Um, I am the scientific go-to person um, with another colleague here when they're looking to explain why the programs are important. Um, and I volunteer because I think if you're going to talk the talk, you got to walk the walk. So I do have sort of a broader perspective, I think, than coming from one program. Um, but the other reason I said yes is because I have a little bit of an ax to grind about community support and stakeholders. Um, and I think about this a lot, particularly in West Virginia. And so I'm not sure I'm going to talk about exactly what Laura wants me to talk about, um, but I do think it's important and this seemed like a really good opportunity to talk about it. So I'm going to share my screen with you. If the host could let me share my screen, that would be great. It says host has disabled participant screen sharing. And I think Lily has control. You should be able to I can, maybe I can stop sharing first. Oh yeah, that might be it. I can do without it, but it's fancier if I show a couple of slides. 
Okay, here we go. Do you have the um, permissions now? Yes, I think so. Um, apology. No problem. Okay. Perfect. Can you see that with the quote there? Okay, great. So yes. our former Surgeon General has talked about this a lot, about the importance of community involvement in um, implementing and supporting harm reduction programs. And I couldn't find the exact quote I wanted, um, but here's a couple. What I want communities to do is have a conversation about their burden of disease, in this case, substance use disorder, coupled with hepatitis and HIV, and talk about what is right for them. And I hope that science is a major part of that conversation. I hope so too, although often I find that science does not play a major role in this, but it should. Um, and then another quote, he sort of elucidated the, the groups that would be part of that. So the public safety community, meaning police and probably fire, business community and the faith-based community. Um, and I was on a panel with him right before he became Surgeon General where he talked about this based on his experiences in Indiana. And I really pushed back because I can't think of a single other evidence-based public health intervention for which we require the support of police, fire, prosecutors, city council. And so in talking about community support and stakeholders, that's a constant struggle for me where I feel like it's a little bit of a, uh, a double standard because we're talking about people who use drugs. Um, and, and it's particularly, I think, uh, for me comes from my place in West Virginia right now as well. Um, I do not contest at all that these are really important partnerships and they're really good to have. And I know the other speakers will talk about really innovative and useful partnerships that they've had that have worked really well with their programs and we have them here too. My struggle comes when that becomes a barrier to actually establishing and running programs. And so to be fair, the CDC talks about this as well. So I am so grateful that they've put out, and Laura, high five, have put out these, these materials on syringe services programs at the end of the last year because they've helped us immensely in advocating for and protecting um, syringe services programs here in West Virginia. So I think there's pretty clear um, consensus that community involvement is important. Um, and this is also reflected in West Virginia. So if you read the guidelines for West Virginia, the very first core guideline in terms of getting certified in West Virginia is building community support prior to implementing a program and maintain that support for the duration. This includes local government, leadership, EMS, police, fire, prosecutors, and the general public. Um, in West Virginia, uh, I don't think it'll be this way for much longer, but we have no sort of approval process for syringe services programs. We have a certification program if you want funding through the state, which is federal money that's dispersed by the state. So if you want money, you have to be certified by the state, but you don't have to be. And so we have several low profile programs that aren't. Um, but we're currently having an issue around exactly what kind of support is required for a program to be certified. Um, so we have one uh, needs-based program in Charleston that was denied certification. And this is from the letter that their denial came from and it's now under appeal. Um, the guidelines make clear the importance of community support, specifically from local government leadership, law enforcement, and prosecutors. To this end, applications must include letters of support from such stakeholders enumerated in the first responder city council officials. So, I underline that word stakeholder because this is what this session is about. And I think a lot, I think it's worth having a conversation about who are stakeholders in harm reduction and syringe services programs in particular, and what role should those stakeholders play? So I actually went and looked it up earlier. <laughs> what is a stakeholder? I think that's a really good question because we use that word a lot, but I don't actually know what it means. Um, and very basically, it's a person with an interest or a concern or something. And if you look it up, it mostly focuses on business. So someone who's a stakeholder in a business venture. Um, and so I just want to challenge us all, I think, to ask some really important questions about stakeholders beyond the ones who we work really well with and who have a lot to bring to our programs. Who are the people that are stakeholders in these programs, in syringe services programs? What power should these stakeholders have to influence whether and how a program operates? 
And this is really important because in West Virginia, and this might be happening in other places too, we're not just having conversations about whether a program can operate, we're having conversations about how it operates and how that should be regulated, um, whether or not we're actually gonna do what the CDC guidelines say or whether we're gonna do something more restrictive. And in large part, that conversation is out of the hands with, of people who have public health expertise in that area. And then should all stakeholders have equal say in whether and how a program operates? Um, does the voice of a prosecutor hold the same weight as the voice of someone who works in public health? Um, what role should the voice of people who use drugs have in all of this? So I think thinking about what stakeholder means and the role they should really have in the operation and existence of these programs is really worth thinking about and having a discussion about. Um, and so I can give you this one example. Um, this is the quote that I showed you before about this particular organization that's trying to get certification in Charleston, West Virginia. And I'll also say we have two injection related HIV outbreaks going on here. So we have one in Huntington um, and we have one in Charleston. And Charleston right now does not have a needs-based harm reduction program. Um, and this is where this program that was looking for certification has been denied certification. Um, so the certifier is looking for letters of support from first responders and city council officials. What this organization has had, this is Rabbi Yurecki. They have the stated support of almost 30 faith leaders. They have the support of, I think when they put this sign on letter in, it had the support of 140 West Virginia public health and um, medical professionals. They have the support of all of these organizations who have signed a support letter, but they don't have the support of first responders and city and county officials. And that's what's keeping this program from being certified. Um, so going more to the issue of uh, what our programs look like and how they have gained public support or stakeholder support, however you wanna define it. The majority of our programs are run through health departments. Um, and that looks different in different places. So in the corner at the top is the Cabell County, uh, Cabell Huntington Health Department. Huntington has been really hit hard by the drug problem and they have really worked hard to take a community-based approach to solving it. So that program is very well supported by the vast majority of stakeholders um, although they did have to restrict some of their operations a few years ago to keep open, and now they have 120, I think, injection-related HIV cases largely as a result. Um, so that's one example of um, how going against public health guidance can really have an impact. The second picture is of Angie Gray, who is this heroic public health nurse in um, Berkeley, Morgan County. By sheer force of will, she started a program at that health department and has used her personal relationships and building those relationships to keep that program supported and going. And she has excellent public support in Berkeley County. Um, West Virginia is largely rural, right? And so like in a lot of communities of people on this call, personal relationships matter. So the third picture on the right is the Wyoming County Health Department. That's one that I helped start up. Um, their support largely came from the fact that the people that run the health department are so well respected in that community that they went and said what they needed to do and that they thought it was important and they got support in doing it. Um, but again, these approaches are different. So Pineville, West Virginia, where this program is based out of, has a population of less than 700 people. Huntington has a population of 48,000 people. And so what community support looks like and stakeholders look like in those two places is very different. Uh, Milan Push for Health Right is the oldest program we have here. They open very quietly, but they're a well-supported free clinic in Morgantown. And so they already have a lot of community support. And then finally, um, the one on the bottom is SOAR. They run out of a parking lot, which people have problems with, um, but it's actually good for COVID and they run based on CDC best practices, which is very low barrier and um, uh, needs-based distribution. So very different programs, 
very different ways of gaining community support or stakeholder support um, and very different rates of success in doing that based on the environment and the politics that are playing out. So um, as an academic person, I can help all of these programs with science. I can help them in terms of how they can run their programs. I can, I can um, talk at hearings about the science. But there are other things related to drug use and how people feel about drug use that it's more difficult for me to speak to. Um, but I do think having someone in academics is useful. Um, and I think I'll leave it there to give the other speakers sufficient time. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks so much, Robin. And you totally hit the points that I was thinking of. Um, because I think that there is a real role, potential role and nice role um, for to really highlight the, the you know, the space um, and the ways that academic, ac academia can, can support programs and can support um, building support for programs, especially considering testimony and things like that. Similar for health departments, right? There's a unique role that you all can play with, with um, you know, sort of lowercase advocacy, because we all know health departments can't really technically do that. But it's still really, really vitally important um, that we all understand and sort of the unique roles there. And uh, you you like led into several different speakers, but I, I love that you started with the idea of sort of um, addressing that if we centralize law enforcement quite often, even though they're incredibly valuable community stakeholders, often quite essential to build support with, that if we, if we continue centralizing them in this conversation, we really um, allow them sort of this open door or if we can, at times they can, you know, that can be perceived as like, that then they have a right to interfere with public health programming. So that's their role. Um, and, and I think we would all argue that that's just not accurate, right? Um, and I, I'll also note that here on this panel in the past, we have always had someone who's a harm reduction cop, always had someone who's public safety. And this year we made a very intentional choice to decentralize that voice and really think uh, a little more outside the box about what um, the diversity of, of you know, real uh, support bases for these programs. So, Donald, I'm going to kick that, you know, on that note, I'm going to kind of kick over to you, um, you know, really recognizing Louisville, you know, in the last year has had, um, you know, obviously uh, ongoing protests about racialized police killings and uh, the killing of Breonna Taylor is all too many across the country. Um, and, uh, you know, really, I'm, I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about sort of some of the ways that um, this last year shaped how you have approached uh, stakeholder groups and building partnerships um, with mutual aid and Black Lives Matter folks. Okay, thank you. Um, I can't see good. I got these little, I had an eye exam this morning. They put a ton of um, drops in my eyes to, and uh, I can't see. So I have these sunglasses on, but um, I'm gonna do the best I can because I have some stuff I have to read here. But um, thank you, um, Donald Davis from, I'm the executive director at the Kentucky Harm Reduction Coalition. And uh, I've been in Louisville here for almost eight years, about seven and a half years. I moved here from New York where I worked at um, New York Harm Reduction Educators as the uh, hepatitis coordinator. Uh, but moving to Louisville um, was um, a little bit of a culture shock. Uh, I, I knew that uh, Kentucky had uh, one of the highest rates of hepatitis C, and I figured I'd have to build myself a job. And um, it wasn't that hard. My retirement lasted maybe two weeks, and uh, I met some people, and we um, formed the Kentucky Harm Reduction Coalition just to do uh, naloxone uh, trainings and distribution throughout the city. And now we have grown to where we're mailing out um, naloxone all over the state. Um, so um, in the last year, like Laura was saying, it's, it's, been, it's been kind of trying here in Louisville with the unrest that happened last year um, and the, uh, the death of uh, Breonna Taylor and just everything that went on with COVID. Uh, COVID uh, kind of slowed things down and um, we had to, we never closed. Uh, there was a couple of times we did close because someone in the office contracted COVID uh, and we had to, you know, everybody had to go get tested. But during that time, um, we have uh, the Kentucky Harm Reduction Coalition, we have, uh, we share offices with um, an agency, uh, LRCC, it's a treatment agency, the, the Louisville Recovery uh, Community Connection. And um, the uh, executive director and I, we looked at it and we said, you know, we saw that 
you know, to get into a recovery, uh, you, you practice harm reduction first. Harm reduction comes first. So we, we've done that. And um, we do, um, we just got a grant. And this is, this is really exciting. We just got a grant with the Kentucky Harm Reduction Coalition, LRCC, to do the treatment part. Uh, the Kentucky Harm Reduction Coalition to do the harm reduction, the syringe exchange, naloxone training and distribution, fentanyl distribution, fentanyl test strips distribution, excuse me. And um, also the University of Louisville Hospital uh, to do MAT. We can refer people to do uh, over there to get into their MAT program for Suboxone. And it, it's a good combination because one agency can't do it all. And with harm reduction, you have so many avenues that have to be, that you have to go down. And um, if you're not, if that's not your, your set avenue to go down, then you have to find somebody to work with you and to, uh, to establish a presence uh, in that community. Uh, we are uh, specifically working on the West End of Louisville, which is the predominantly uh, African-American community. And we're doing that because uh, that community has been pretty overlooked, very marginalized and disenfranchised in a lot of ways. So the three agencies uh, we're going to be working on the um, over in the West End. We also, um, I also work with the health department because in Kentucky, the health department is the lead agency for syringe exchange or harm reduction in that county. So we have a, a MOU with the health department that we renewed just recently and um, to do syringe exchange. And so that's, that's important to have that um, partnership. You have to have that partnership in order to do it, to get permission from them to do syringe exchange. Um, what, what else has happened here in Louisville with the homeless camps, it's, it, that is really um, taken off. And um, we got involved, uh, Jennifer Twyman from the health department brought us in, you know, said, we need you to come over there, do fentanyl test strips, do um, naloxone training and distribution. So the health department is involved. We have uh, the homeless outreach team and it's community liaison, liaison police. It's two police officers who are out at the camps three to five days a week. And they will start at one camp and they may do two or three camps in a day. Uh, you have Hip Hop Cares who does uh, food. And uh, Phoenix, they do, they do community assessments for housing. And because we want to try, they're trying to get as many homeless people into housing as possible. So you have these, these agencies who team up together and have these partnerships. And we're in the communities um, pretty much six days a week. Uh, you have uh, the, and I forgot the, the uh, University of Kentucky with their program uh, to expand HIV testing and syringe exchange in counties that don't have syringe exchanges. And uh, last year, Kentucky had more ex syringe exchanges than any other state in the, in the, in the country. And uh, they're small, very small um, counties. They may not be open, uh, but one day a week, two days a week. And then um, some of them are limited to what they can give out. So uh, just recently, um, we we're writing a grant and with another agency to try to do some advocacy, local advocacy, statewide advocacy to try to get them to loosen up some of the, um, the real strict um, rules that they have for a syringe exchange if you're taking money from the state. If you're, um, if you're not a needs-based uh, agency, which Louisville ends up being pretty much the only one in the state, everyone else is a one-for-one. One. And some counties where you have to give out uh, retractable syringes, which are the worst and the most expensive. Uh, there's a county that, um, Richmond County, I believe it is, it, uh, they can't give out cookers or tourniquets. So we want to try to start advocating uh, so we can um, break up some of that and so they can loosen some of these some of these rules. And that you have to advocate and advocating, we have to advocate with the local health department first. Uh, and, and because that's who uh, they make the rules up. Then we have to advocate with the city councils. Uh, and so once we get to Frankfurt, advocating with the state senate, it's, it's a job and one agency can't do it. 
and everything that I've talked about this morning, it's not where one agent can, agency can do all of that. Uh, with um, with the three, the other two agencies that we're partnering with, uh, we're bringing um, LRCC is bringing in an agency that has a portable shower, so we can get people, uh, you know, showered. Um, we're always going to try to find an agency, and we do have an agency that's on the west end of Louisville that um, hands out food to the needy. And uh, the homeless population in the west end of Louisville, they're not in tents. They're in abandoned houses. So um, the homeless outreach team, uh, they are starting to uh, do more on the west end of Louisville, going into some of the abandoned houses. Um, one of my employees who is from that area, from, grew up in the west end, knows of these houses and pretty much can tell you where to go, which house to go to. And we, they will do that because, because we're doing expanded naloxone uh, distribution on the West End of Louisville. So um, you have to have partnerships uh, in order to get all the harm reduction services to the people that you wanna reach. Um, like I said earlier, one agency can't do it all. Uh, one of the uh, portable showers, that's almost a million dollars in itself. So, uh, and trying to get funding for all of that is, uh, is kind of asking a lot. But if we can team up and work with other agencies that are working in the homeless community or the harm reduction community, the drug using community, then we come together, we have a strategic plan of what we want to do and how we want to do it. And we get out there and, and get it done as expeditiously as possible. And getting people into MAT is important because a lot of people, um, abstinence-based treatment doesn't work for everybody. And MAT is important. Um, I'm in recovery myself. Um, I didn't go through MAT. I use abstinence-based, but I understand MAT and, it's, and I understand the importance of it. So, um, I think that we have to educate the community about the importance of MAT and we have to educate the community about the importance of harm reduction and syringe service programs. Uh, because if you miss educating them, then they're going to want, they're not going to want you there. Why are you here? You know, they're going to ask that. So you have to bring in the city council, the council person, uh, the health departments and other uh, nonprofit agencies that understand harm reduction and uh, explain to the community why we're here, what we're going to do, and how it can better the community. And that's when you start getting more community involvement. And community involvement is important because if you don't have community involvement, you may not be able to put a mobile syringe exchange site in that, in that community. Uh, some people still back up from that. The, the health um, here in Louisville, the syringe exchange has been up for about five years now. And, um, there are certain areas we still can't get into because you know we don't have that type of stuff going on in our in our neighborhood which is ridiculous for anybody to say but they do so uh, we have to we have to try to find other agencies that are maybe in that community they're in that community and they have a voice in the community so we address them they address the community along with us and we can get our our educational piece together for the community so they don't have an issue with um, having a syringe exchange program coming into their into their neighborhood. Um, I mean building these uh, building these uh, um, partnerships is very important because without these partnerships then you know services are going to be missed. Uh, services for people who need the services are going to be missed uh, and they're going to be uh, kind of ignored. So you want to try to find um, agencies within the, within the particular community that you want to work in they have a voice in the community and uh, who will work with you and understand exactly what you're doing and what you're trying to do for the community so you're so modest it. you're like and that's it that's all <laughs> no problem you know me <laughs> <laughs> he's a dumb man of modesty um <laughs> When you bring up, I mean, just like so many, so many good points, um, you know, really recognizing that there's just so many diverse community stakeholders who are 
stakeholders I mean, we should define that term but who are who are doing you know already doing so much good work and the importance of partnering and teaming as agencies i think that's one of the things i hear from programs starting up quite often is they're like okay but then how do we do like everything and like everything on site and the answer is like no like start slow get good at what you're doing and then find other people who are already doing that work and if there aren't the other people then there's an action step and i think the other thing that you really bring up is is especially in light of covid especially in light of this very challenging unprecedented last year um, that syringe access programs for the most part have really stayed open and modified services and often ought to stay open um, and we're also are also being asked to do more and more and more um, in terms of general um, access to showers access to hand washing access to basic social services um, because i'll be honest a lot of other organizations close um, and, you know, are in a different sort of state of transition around what they can offer. And so I think, you know, really uh, centralizing just how important these programs are as a touch point for all those other services um, and making those agency partnerships really, uh, really, really pressing um, and important. So I appreciate that. Um, and so I'm going to kick it over to, to Michelle Mathis from, from Olive Branch Ministries and talk a little bit about, you know, the way that you approach this work, um, because it is certainly, uh, from what I know, quite comprehensive and uh, comes from a, a real place of putting that person first. So. Um, still muted. Yep. There we go. Thank Sorry, you. I'm operating from Zoom from my phone right now. Um, so thank you for uh, allowing me to talk about faith and harm reduction. Uh, faith in harm reduction for us is the proclamation that people are needed and wanted, that they are loved and they are holy enough, and that they are holy and enough. And I think um, so oftentimes when we're working with faith communities that um, there are things that get in the way of some really good potential work that could happen. Um, and it gets in the ways on, on both sides. And so what I do um, as a, a person of faith, a faith leader, um, and as a harm reductionist is try to bridge the, the gap between the two worlds. In harm reduction, we say that um, we meet people where they are, but then we demand that the faith community meet us where we are, but we don't meet the faith community where they are. And um, we you know, have to enter into this work with the understanding that not every body of faith, not every church or synagogue is going to run a, run a syringe exchange out of their fellowship hall, right, um, or their meeting space. Um, they're not going to host 12, uh, 12 step support groups or non-traditional support groups, but there are still very viable and helpful ways that they can be involved in harm reduction. Um, we are fortunate that there are faith uh, communities and faith groups that do want to get into the nitty gritty, the down and dirty, um, which I love of, about harm reduction. And in fact, I'm sitting in space provided by a local community church uh, that we have our office in here in Hickory, North Carolina. So when we talk about harm reduction, I think it's really important at the very beginning to understand that um, for harm reductionists, there's two there's two types of harm reduction, right? There's harm reduction with the big HR, which is the overall guiding philosophy. Um, that's a movement built on um, social justice and a belief in um, and respect for the rights of people who use drugs. And then we have the little HR, which is the day to day um, operational type things, um, you know, providing space, um, reducing the negative consequences of high risk behaviors and whatever various forms those services take. And we find that many times faith communities want to get involved with the little HR, but they don't understand the big HR principle. So what we do um, here at Olive Branch Ministry is try to help communicate what that big HR looks like, what the philosophy of harm reduction is, and then help find the church or the, you know, the body of faith find um, ways that they can get plugged into harm reduction in a way that their congregation is comfortable. Because just as we know that not every community is ready for um, all levels of harm reduction, and we see that a lot, you know, uh, I guess all over really, um, some communities are very progressive and they want to embrace harm reduction all the way and some are very anti-harm reduction, uh, the same way with communities of faith. So we um, provide a menu of services of possible ideas that folks can get involved with um, in, a, in a way that they're comfortable. Um, and that involves everything from um, medication take back 
which uh, I know that some harm reductionists are against medication take back, right? Because it kills the clean drug supply. Um, but for, for some folks that is harm reduction in their own household. So providing information to, to congregations about what is medication take back and how do you work effectively with law enforcement to make sure that that happens. And that provides opportunities to then um, engage your congregation and engage your, um, your um, you know, folks on what is the overdose crisis and what are opioids and what is, you know, who's at high risk of an overdose and who's at high risk of things like HIV and hep C. But you do it in a way, um, in a space that is a uh, comfortable conversation. And pardon me, I must say, um, I am a Christ follower. And so um, I don't use the term Christian, but I am a Christ follower. And so a lot of my vernacular is ingrained in my Southern upbringing. So I'm not meaning to exclude other um, faiths um, or folks of non-theological faith. Um, I'm just using the vernacular that I'm used to, so I, I apologize for that. Um, so medication take back is one option that, that we're able to uh, partner with, with congregations on. Um, the next one is um, hosting naloxone trainings and uh, doing uh, naloxone kit or overdose response kits. Um, one of the things that we've done talking about unique partnerships is there's a local group that we partner with um, made up of primarily uh, women in their late 60s to early 80s. And um, we have created with them uh, through their crochet group, a program called Hookin' for Hope. And that Hookin' for Hope program actually makes these, which are little bags um, that we put naloxone in. And this bag is amazing because it has, you can't see it here, I could put it up really close, but there's a reflective thread in this gathering stream. And that reflective thread allows people who don't have access to electric light, um, maybe cell phone light, maybe natural light, maybe, maybe candle light, um, but it allows folks to find the naloxone in the dark in places that um, may not again have access to ready light, right? And we know a lot of our folks are housing unstable or living in tent cities um, or other places that don't have electric light. So this is, um, this is one thing that this particular group who said right out, don't want to, I don't want to mess with people who have drugs. I'm scared of people who, who do drugs. Um, I don't want to talk about that, but um, we want to help. And so this is a way that we can help. And they were making these bags um, for folks that lived in the rest home to keep their medications hung on the back of their wheelchairs. So um, they decided to make these and add the reflective thread, which they were already putting in the hats they were making us for homeless, um, our homeless peeps. And so we put supplies in there. Then talking, bringing it back to the faith community. Oh, and let me just say that these women had no idea what naloxone was, didn't really understand what opioids were, but you know, they had worked with Olive Branch on some other stuff and they wanted to help. Now, every time we go to pick up bags, um, they'll say, hey, have our kits saved anybody? Hey, has anybody used our kits? And so they're very excited and they're engaged at a level they're comfortable at, right? So we met them where they were and they're very effective in what we do. So taking it back to the faith community, I was making this very similar presentation at a particular um, uh, church in another county. And the lady from there said, hey, we have a crochet group at our church. Um, we're, we wanna make bags too. So this is the bag that we got from the one place. This is the bag that we got from the other place. And then this is the next size. So they made bigger bags. So with these bags, we're able to put in syringes and naloxone and everything else that we need. And the beautiful thing about this is that people are engaged. People are excited. People have started conversations and they sit around and talk about what they're making these bags for, right? And it's conversations they wouldn't normally be involved with. The important thing for our participants is that they now have something that someone spent time to make for them and a touch of home. And it's a reminder of grandma or mom or auntie or whoever. Um, and it's something that they love. And we have folks that come in and they want two or three because they want to coordinate them with their backpack and they can hang them on their backpack or they can trade them or whatever. And it's amazing what this little piece of yarn has done um, for transforming the conversation in groups that wouldn't normally do that. 
So that's a possibility, right? And that's innovative and outside the box. And I saw somebody pop up, is there a pattern? Yes, there is a pattern. Um, I'm happy to, to um, give you that. I believe it's posted on our website. If not, it will be by this afternoon. So um, it, it will be up there. Um, churches are already in the, in the um, role of gathering supplies, right? Some people, the first Sunday of each quarter, they gather food for the local food bank or for a particular shelter. Ask folks to gather harm reduction supplies, wound care supplies, um, things that, uh, you know, band-aids, alcohol swabs, Q-tips, things like that um, are very helpful. And your church is already doing that. So just shift the conversation a little bit about, hey, we're already helping this group. Let's, let's help this group as well. Then here's another, a, a big one. Um, many churches have um, and communities of faith have vans or small minibuses that they use to transport port people, right? To vacation Bible school, to Sunday school, the Bible study, to, you know, trip to the mountains, whatever. But those things sent, set empty Monday through Saturday, and they're only used on Sundays. How about we provide transportation for folks who are going to MAT or folks that need to go to court? Or folks that want to have visits with, um, uh, you know, supervised visits with CPS, but they don't have a way to get there to see their kids. You have volunteers in your church that probably already drive the van. You probably have seniors that are up before God on Sunday, you know, on mornings during the week that are available to take people to a 5.30 or a 6 or a 6.30 a.m. MAT appointment. Put folks in your van and take them to where they need to go. Transportation is a huge barrier to care. But when you do that, and I put this caveat in there, don't play Jesus music. Don't play religious music. You know, put on a little Bob Seger, you know, a little Dolly Parton, whatever your, your thing is. But we ain't got to talk about Jesus. He's not even awake at that time of the morning. Okay, let's let him sleep and not engage people in theology conversation. Let's just address their physical needs, right? Time for theology is later. Right now, we're talking about being present. So that's important. For us here in this particular space, um, where we are in Hickory, we were able to get this space through um, a beautiful grant from HEP Connect. And that allowed us to do things like art therapy and music therapy and centered mindfulness groups, yoga groups, um, pet therapy. Um, we were blessed with 10 puppies this summer. And so we've had, you know, some of the puppies have come up here, you know, to be with folks. Um, and before COVID hit, we were, you know, really getting at, folks engaged with all of that. Because of COVID, we had to stop some, but next month we're going to start back up. But all that to say, these groups are not led by therapists. They're led by peers. They're led, led by folks with lived and living experience. And that's what's key, is um, getting folks involved at a level that they're comfortable with, right? And when somebody comes to a paint party, they don't say, oh, well, you know, I have THC in my system. Oh, and I have Suboxone in my system. No, they say, hey, can you pass me that orange because my sunflower needs some darker color, right? And that's the thing. We don't ask folks why they're here. We just say we're thankful that you're here. And that's a really, um, um, that's really important. So we, we are fortunate um, also that we are able to partner with the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition and um, that we are able to carry this uh, message of faith um, through some of the agencies that they work with. Um, and in full disclosure, I'm also on the, the board chair for North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, but then we also partner with the North Carolina Council of Churches, which is an ecumenical group. And so I travel all over the state with them and now I do it virtually. And I think I've done 16 talks with them in the last couple of years to different faith communities, faith leaders that come from all different walks of faith. And we're able it's, to- It's really um, cool, this lady. We're able to- um, work with um, those faith leaders to have kind of a similar conversation and talk about polling your congregation and, and uh, finding out what kind of conversations they're willing to have and then engage them in those. And then finally, and, and I'll, I'll be quiet, but um, we're part of the National Faith and Harm Reduction Movement as well. Um, and our mission basically is just um, 
to create a healing justice movement that um, partners faith communities with people who use drugs to develop resources, right, to be able to bridge those gaps um, and uh, carry on the harm reduction message. Um, finally, I guess a personal philosophy of mine is so often we have the phrase of, um, and you hear it all the time, there but for the grace of God go I. Right. And we usually say that in talking down to folks or talking down about folks. Oh, well, you know, except for the grace of God, that's where I would be. I choose to flip that around and say there because of the grace of God, go I. And because of that, because of the grace that I've been shown in this work and in my life, um, both spiritual and non-spiritual, um, it has allowed me to go places I never would have thought to work with the most beautiful people that I never um, would have thought possible. And it's all because of that grace. So don't look at it as, as a negative, look at it as a positive and just be present, be present in everything that you do and opportunity will present itself to serve. I'm the words moderator. I always like tear up a little. Um, that was beautiful. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and it's so interesting. I've always viewed that phrase in a positive way. Um, so that it's just like fascinating um, to hear that most people think of that as a negative. And uh, yeah, just so many good good nuggets in there. I mean, really thinking creatively about uh, meeting your community where they're at and bringing their skills into this. We we do some work with a small little scrappy program in Philadelphia who also works with some uh, some knitters to, to knit winter wear um, for participants. And uh, they, you know, one of their grandkids uh, has a play group and the kids like write notes like you are loved and they put them in every every, you know, little packet that goes out. And it's those things that really bring the humanity to, to these programs and really, you know, bring, you know, opportunities, uh, you know, to share uh, that space and humanity. And um, yeah, and I'll stop talking, but I will, I will just say my adorable little nephew um, uh, is raised knowing about Jesus and he is raised knowing about Jesus as the original social justice warrior. Um, and he is the one who would hang out with all the people who are, you know, like that's how his eight-year-old brain processes, um, you know, the, the historical character. And uh, I think that's so true. He's the original harm reduction. Thing. Yeah. With folks who are engaged in sex work, folks who are using drugs, folks who are using whatever substances are going through struggles. And so it's so, so vitally important. Yeah. Um, Let your faith be your why and not your what. There you go. <laughs> I love it. Uh, okay, so Christina, uh, I want to give you as much time as, as you need um, to tell us a little bit more about um, the ending the HIV epidemic, you know, plan and, and sort of your role in it and um, some of the experiences that you've had working primarily with health departments um, around community engagement um, and maybe any things that you've learned, you know, gleaned from this session today. Thank you, Laura, and I don't know how I'm going to follow all of our panelists, but I will try. Uh, and try not to down the the feeling of the room, the virtual room. But uh, thank you again. My name is Christina Santana. I'm a senior manager at, at NASDAQ and I work on our prevention team. And as Laura said, most of my work at this current moment is around uh, community engagement within the Ending the HIV Epidemic Plan. Um, However, I've also worked across um, the, our, the care side of, of HIV. Most of my, my, my professional background is specific to HIV and, and sexual health. Um, but I've also been a housing case manager at a local ASO prior to uh, coming to NASDAQ. Um, and within the AEHE, I'm not sure how familiar folks are with, with this plan, so I'll give a, a brief general overview of it. So in 2019, the administration released uh, the, the Ending the HIV Epidemic Plan initiative, um, basically identifying 57 jurisdictions where a concentrated effort and funding would be delivered uh, to reduce the number of new HIV diagnosis uh, within those regions. Essentially saying that if we are able to reduce the number of new diagnosis and control um, uh, viral suppression and along the care continuum, 
that we could effectively eliminate HIV um, as we know it today. Um, so within that, CDC and HRSA along with HHS came together and created a, a, a long guideline of what they were expecting for these EAG plans. Um, and really with the hopes of being innovative. Um, take that with a grain of salt, however you will. <laughs> um, and a lot of that is dependent on the actual jurisdictions and what the needs are for their community. So in order to promote that innovation and um, looking at uh, addressing HIV in, in new ways that we potentially we haven't been able to before, uh, they asked the health departments as they were developing plans to intentionally involve the community in this process, reach out to the various stakeholders, reach out to the communities that haven't typically been involved or that we know are disproportionately impacted by HIV but aren't necessarily invested the same way due to a number of reasons. Um, in you know, strengthening HIV programming. Um, so with this project itself, building off of existing funding opportunities already available to, uh, from the, the CDC, this project is specific towards community engagement. So how can NASDAD support health departments in the South uh, for, for us, uh, this project was happening concurrently with other organizations who were focused on different regions throughout the US. Um, so the NASA was working with the South, but how can we support uh, them in bringing new voices, new partnerships, ensuring that community engagement, um, you know, isn't, isn't just transactional, isn't this thing that is needed to make funding uh, to get funding or to, you know, make your report that it's this actual symbiotic relationship that strengthens community, therefore strengthening program and uh, works mutually in that way. So uh, this is, it has been an eight month program, which um, speaking honestly, that that's a problem. That's, that's a real big problem if we're talking about community engagement, which is a long term commitment, you know, community engagement should be cumulative um, and not a small project. Um, but given that that barrier, we at NASA decided, how can we best support health departments to at least start in the process of examining how to integrate community engagement uh, meaningfully into the work that they are doing and how can they bring in those new stakeholders, those non-traditional partners and have that have a commitment to that sustainable uh, process of community engagement. So the way that we've been doing it for this project is building off of existing resources that we have um, as well as trying to integrate new resources um, and 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 processes into the work that we're doing. So uh, we all know COVID kind of shook up everything and um, we've had to reimagine how we engage with folks. And a lot of that for us has been having those conversations with health departments, having the conversations with community, but we all know about Zoom fatigue and all of these various things. So we started to look at other aspects like social media. We had had initial conversation with health departments who in the process of finalizing their EHG plan were holding town halls with community. Well, come COVID, they had to stop those town halls, but they still needed to get the, you know, reach out to the community, get that information and ensure that, you know, there's authentic representation and voices from the community within these plans. So a lot of them turned to social media they looked at how to utilize these platforms. Um, and that's exactly what we also did. So folks were streaming their meetings that they could publicly stream, uh, you know, like their planning group meetings, streaming those via Facebook Live and other avenues. Um, we at NASA had hosted um, Facebook Live events too, uh, trying to gather that information 
And I'll also point out for our project, we brought on community consultants. We know we are a national partner. And although, you know, our work is to provide technical assistance to the health departments, which then in turn gets, um, you know, trickled down into the, the community, we know that we are still removed from folks. Uh, so we wanted to bring on consultants who had direct experience, uh, knowledge, and, and were willing to, to work with us to create several different resources and uh, work on this project. So we using them, we were able to host these live sessions and have honest conversations about what building trust and partnership with health departments and CBO really looks like. Um, and this, I think, was really helpful because we were able to have conversations with folks about partners that they wanted to bring at the table. Some of, uh, you know, some folks talked about being small business owners and how that they're never engaged in that aspect of their identity, that they're only engaged as identifying as a gay man but not necessarily in these other aspects of their lives that have a lot of meaning to them. Uh, so that was, that was really helpful for us as we move through this, um, through this process. I'll also say that, you know, we uh, did some focus grouping with organiz or with groups and um, really talked about what it is that, uh, that has, that stands in the way of, of wanting to commit to work with health departments um, and CBOs. And uh, again, for, for, for folk, a lot of folks, it was not feeling valued, not feeling valued. And this isn't new. These are things that we know. These are things that community continues to share over and over again. So with this project, we really felt we had an opportunity to create resources in a concise place um, where that would kind of bring together all of these things we know community has been has been sharing with us over the years. Um, so I'm just going to share some things that that came up in these these conversations. Um, but when we talk about enhancing stakeholder representation, generally we think about who is missing, where are they, um, how can we connect with them, and how can we make this process accessible and meaningful. Um, but some of the things that we don't, some of the other questions that we don't ask is, um, what have been the barriers with working with them and why have they been the barriers? So we may ask what are the barriers, but we don't necessarily explore the why and really take the time to digest it because I guarantee you those whys are big and they have a huge impact on individuals' feelings and a willingness to, to present. Um, and then also some other things that came up, um, knowing what the engagement level each partner is willing to commit is really important. It will not look the same for each stakeholder, for each partner. And you should have those conversations and communications to, to gauge that. Um, and you know, being honest, you're within an organization or an agency yourself, and you may not have the willingness or not the willingness, I'm sorry, you may have limitations in what your organization is able to share. Being upfront and honest while you're having those conversations with stakeholders and the community is crucial. Um, not using it as an excuse, but being just straightforward and transparent about it. Some other things that came up, um, you know, obviously community engagement and stakeholder uh, partnership building it's a process. You cannot, you cannot rush through it and it requires a lot of upfront work. And again, thinking back to what I said, we have kind of shaped community engagement as this transactional process and rethinking how we're doing it uh, to be mutually beneficial is, is really um, an important thing to remember as we do it, as we um, continue through the process. Um, enter the new relationships with humility. Uh, you know, sustainability is dependent on a genuine investment um, in what is happening. And then um, 
ensure the folks that you're inviting in can be trusted and are trusted by the community. And if there's uncertainty about them, we need to be able to set accountability measures and so that they, so that we know that they're willing to do the work to build trust with community. Um, and I think, you know, that relates a little bit to what we've been talking or what was brought up with law enforcement communities. Um, you know, that there's huge power dynamics in play right there and uh, understanding and recognizing those power dynamics is crucial. And then some last things that were shared um, that, you know, focusing on, we, there's been this huge focus within, I'll speak for, for HIV because that is the majority of where my work is, but there's been this huge focus on what is missing, where are the gaps, where are the barriers, what are the challenges, instead of focusing on what are the shared values, what are the strengths, where does power lie, who, you know, who is a leader in the community, we, we often, you know, focus it from a deficit based approach. And if we just flip that to a, an asset based or strength based approach, um, there's a lot of opportunities to uh, show community that we're not, we're, you know, we're not approaching this as a problem issue. We're trying to approach it holistically and really capture how to improve your quality of life and health and help, you know, strengthen and support your, your own autonomy within it. Um, and, you know, I think the last thing I'll, I'll share is just um, within this project is we have some other, um, I like to think innovative <laughs> uh, approaches to what we're doing. So we are, we're working with the consultants to create trainings, not trainings, that's, that's the wrong word, but to create resources, um, talking about their, you know, what it means to engage with various communities culturally, through a culturally responsive lens. And, you know, understanding that the conversations that you may need to have are going to be uncomfortable and there are going to be things you may not want to change. But if we're going to achieve the goals of EEG and we're going to build partnership, um, these conversations need to be had. Um, and, you know, I, and this will actually be the last thing. But um, I just wanted to share some of the non-traditional partners and stakeholders that we have heard through the conversations with um, with health departments. Um, and some of these may not be new to you, but I, I think we don't hear enough about this. So um, a lot of organizations have been really trying to intentionally integrate housing authority organizations into their work, um, not just what we've typically seen of referrals, but how do you actually leverage each other's resources and, and, um, and um, funding to create kind of wraparound housing services. We've had uh, health departments and CBOs partner with restaurants where they will provide gift cards or uh, money to go to restaurants, you know, in the services that, the, uh, that they're providing like through testing or things like that. Um, obviously faith-based institutions and, and not just, uh, those we, we, you know, the predominant Christian umbrella of, of faith, but also looking at uh, Buddhism and Islam and um, some of these other faith institutions. Um, universities and schools. So universities may not be as new, but um, really looking at how the partner with schools and creating um, kind of separate community boards with the university. And that has created a lot of advocacy for the youth. Um, lastly, social media influencers and local influencers that has, has grown a lot. Um, the office of the mayor in one jurisdiction, they were able to get their, their, the mayor's office to work with them. And then also smaller non 501c3 organizations. So organizations that are doing the work, but may not have that 501c3 designation by supporting them with smaller grants or micro grants. Um, so I'll pause there because I, I want to leave some time for 
uh, discussion. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Christina. And um, yeah, and, and I, I think, you know, so much, it's so helpful to like kind of bring in these, these multiple levels of systems and projects and programs. And, you know, you can be modest too, right? Because I, I think, let's be clear in terms of the, this project's, uh, you know, origin of it. I mean, they're calling meaningful community engagement innovative, which is, is challenging, right? For me to even kind of hear and stomach. And sometimes there is um, a perceived or, or, you know, actual, very actual, um, you know, sort of gap uh, between public health systems and community pro community based programs, um, and and uh, really highlighting that there are opportunities to be engaging in this in this project, and also uh, hopefully, you know, much longer than the eight month you know, runway that you all were given. Um, but that just, I mean, it speaks to just uh, sort of coming full circle back to that definition of stakeholder that, that Robin had brought up, right? And stakeholder is actually on that list of um, sort of like, no, no terms to use, like maybe kind of offensive. And at first I heard that and I was like, like what, so like vampires? No, no, no. Um, so it's, it, you know, deemed offensive because often stakeholder as a term, um, you know, really speaks to tokenized unpaid involvement, right? Um, and, and, and so, you know, recognizing that there's real opportunity with, with increased uh, federal attention around HIV prevention and, and the epidemics and syringe access programs. And then there's also this real recognition that these programs are, you know, the community. And, and so there's, there's a big space to, to bridge there. Um, and so I guess, well, I, I do want to turn it over and see if, if Robin, if you have any thoughts about ways that academia, similar to public health, um, can can make sure that they're doing that meaningful community involvement um, and engagement that is not tokenizing, that is um, long term and uh, sustainable. And then I'll just pause to everyone else uh, questions. Put them in the chat because we have about 15, 10 minutes left. That's a really hard question. Um... I have worked with and volunteered with many um, harm reduction syringe services programs in many different places. And um, I, I think there's been a lot of conversation about how do we get something out of partnering with academia? Because often it will be students who want a research project or a, a principal investigator who wants to recruit people from their site and it doesn't always go both ways. So I know there are a few folks that have, um, like I think Hibson DC has some guidelines around working with researchers. Um, I always recommend that you shouldn't do things for free. Your expertise and time is valuable and when you work on a project, you should get paid for it. Um, and just really making sure that, um, you know, just making sure that your participants are paid for being study participants is not enough. Like you're, you're putting time and expertise into that. Everybody on this call has expertise that they should be reimbursed for, right? Um, in terms of partnering at a, sort of a higher level with universities, and I'd be interested to hear what Christina thinks about this, but I just find that really challenging. Universities have a lot of different priorities and interests. And, um, you know, often people get involved who are involved with substance use, but not harm reduction. Um, and so I think you need to find someone in academia who understands harm reduction, who understands the language that we use, who actually engages with people who use drugs, right? Um, I was thinking about this earlier. My feeling is if someone from academia isn't willing to come out and sling syringes with you or make a visit to your site, they might not be someone that you want to work with. That's my own personal opinion. Um, but I think that needs to be a relationship in which both sides benefit and often it's not. I'm, I'm very open to other opinions on that. That's just my experience. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, because I, I do think, you know, as much as I acknowledge that I'm like part of, um, you know, pu public health systems and uh, academic systems historically, you know, in the past, um, there's just, it's, you know, it's, it's in many ways so challenging to be, you know, or it's very, very common in my experience to, to find uh, researchers who, you know, want to 
get this hard to reach population, this studied population, and finding meaningful ways to, to really set boundaries and rules around those um, relationships is, is key. I always say they're not hard to reach if you know how to reach them. True. Right? If you I mean, work with people who do. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is West Virginia. We should be able to reach people who are using preferences. Um, uh, just another couple of things I'll say about that, especially for rural areas, people coming in from outside to do research can do real damage if they don't understand the politics surrounding what's happening. That's real. Um, and, and we've had that experience as well. So just to be aware of that, it, it's all meant well. It's mm -hmm. all done with good intentions, but it, um, it can be a problem if people really don't understand the environment in which they're working, in which they're working. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I feel like I feel like another another thing that kind of came up in in that last conversation has been sort of a thread throughout is like this conversation around. Christine, I don't know how you said it. You, for, like the des the deficit versus scarcity, you know, like I'm sorry, the deficit or scarcity versus like abundance approach and sort of holistic approach. And you said something that was basically like, what what kind of conversations are we having about shared values? And and when I heard that, I was like, yes, shared values. Um, and it made me think like of every conversation that I have with that I've ever had with anyone around what harm reduction is and why it makes sense and why it's the most logical thing um, possible. And you, you kind of go down this like logic rabbit hole with people, uh, with community stakeholders, with, with folks who maybe have opposition to, to programs. And really at the end of the day, it's about finding that place of shared value. And I'm curious, like Donald or Michelle, Robin, if you have any, um, I don't know, highlight success stories, moments where you got that like breakthrough with uh, your local law enforcement or, you know, your librarian or someone, um, you know, when you built up that like, like you know, um, kind of moment. It's kind of a weird question. Well, let me share this one. Uh, hmm. We were we were getting ready and uh, we got permission from a city council person to open up a site in her district in Louisville. and. Um, in that process, you you best thing to do is to go to community boards and talk to them and let them know what's going on because that council person may not have done that. Um, and we had a meeting at a church with the community board. Uh, the council person was with us. Um, as a matter of fact, Emma Roberts was in town from uh, the, the Harmony Ocean Coalition. She was in town and she went with us. And um, we started, hey, Emma, how you doing? <laughs> uh, we started talking uh, to them and we were explaining to them what we wanted to do, why we were doing it. There weren't that many people there. And one of the people, this is Kentucky, so one of the people that was there, he was packing, he had his nine millimeter in his back. And um, one of the people that was with us, Matt LaRocco, he started um, reciting from the Bible. He got real biblical and you know on them. And he started reciting out the Bible. And when we left there, when we got there, they, they, you know, they were real skeptical. They didn't understand it. They didn't want it in their neighborhood. But when we left, they said, if that site doesn't work out, you can use our parking lot. And um, that was moving to hear, you know, to go in in the beginning. And people were very skeptical, didn't, didn't see where their neighborhood needed it and then uh, leaving there and them offering their parking lot to us. So I, I, that was a success story there to me. And that was at the beginning of the syringe exchange here in Louisville. And uh, I thought that that, I, I, I just can't forget that, just the way it happened and the way it played out. Can, can we have a shout out for church parking lots? <laughs> Church parking lots have saved more lives they have. in in Appalachia and rural America than any place else I know. Yeah, I'd like to say somebody asked if we're meeting if our office is inside a church. We're not, but we're in a mobile, uh, a double wide mobile home in a parking lot behind a church. And um, that was, um, we searched for eight years for space within our own hometown and they say, a prophet's not welcome in their own hometown, right? And for eight years, we searched for space and we operated out of our house. And um, through one of those um, uh, talks with the Council of Churches here in Hickory, we had a pastor who reached out to us and said, I have space. And um, we have, we've been here for a little over a year and it's just been amazing. 
the nicest. Yeah, no, church parking lots, absolutely. Um, well, we have literally just like one or two minutes left. Um, we have a couple questions in here, uh, you know, that maybe we can just answer really quickly before we wrap up and kind of go to break. But um, Donald, one question for you about um, your partnership with uh, law enforcement in the uh, uh, homeless outreach, the houseless outreach um, street teams and how, how that's perceived um, from the folks you are doing the outreach to. Oh, well, the, 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 uh, the participants or the people that live in the homeless camps, they look forward to that visit. Mm. Um, and they have a, you know, the police have a good rapport with the participants. They know the participants. They know some of them by name. Uh, and the, the participants know them by name. So it's not an issue with, with that set of police, those two policemen, mm. um, Jessica and Yoshi. It's not a, it's not a problem with them. They can go into a camp and you know be welcomed because they come with you know they come uh, with with services that that's needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should get them to do trainings or you to do trainings about building up support you know rapport with the, those those folks. That's great. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I think that you know, I, I, this is my feeling. There, you know, all police aren't bad, and you may find one or two right. in your police department that understand what you're doing and they support what you're doing and will try to help you get it going and get it started and keep it up and running. So I think that you, you, you look for those, the, the good cops. That's right. You know, you do, you look for the good cops. That's right, That's right. they're there, that's real. Okay, two minutes left. Um, any parting advice, wisdom, thoughts from our amazing panel? I just love starting off these things with, with this group in particular, um, it makes, my heart warm so um and excited for the rest of the, the time so parting thoughts wisdom be present it be mm. present and available and the work will find and present itself to you mm. thank you michelle uh emma just remind me so we have a lot of legislative activity going around in west virginia that would restrain restrict eliminate harm reduction depending on the wording um, if you're interested in learning about that, ACLU West Virginia is a great place to learn about it and learn how you can help us out. We're really tired. <laughs> so um, we appreciate the help and the support. We know it's coming from everywhere. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I just want to say thank you to everyone and my fellow panelists. I uh, really enjoyed uh, being here and I appreciate you welcoming into this welcoming into the space. Thank you for having me again. I look forward to it. I do. Donald, you can stay just stay pinned all day, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's, You're it's always these, it's these gatherings that remind me how much I miss being in a room with all of you and just the love and power that comes from this because this work can be so isolating. So Nice to see everybody and thanks for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just couldn't agree more. Um, like I've said, you know, I'm a terrible moderator because I usually tear up a little bit and then, you know, try to hold that back. But um, really just so appreciate this panel.